So uh, this is actually the title of the session, and uh, I thought it was reasonably appropriate for my talk. And we'll start with uh, the key messages in case anybody uh, is, needs to have a rest in the middle of the talk. I always like to start here. So the first one is that uh, solutions to wicked problems are different from solutions to simple or complicated problems. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between simple complicated and complex problems, and trying to get you to understand that, that we have to think very differently about complex problems as opposed to uh, complicated problems. Um, integration is a wicked problem, and uh, you, most of you will know that better than I. I'm not really a health system researcher. I come at this from a complex systems point of view, but it's pretty easy to see that that's a very wicked problem. And then lastly, talk a little bit about a systems approach to learning uh, from what we do in order to um, uh, improve health system transformation. And that's really about applying principles from complex uh, adaptive systems. So here's one example of a wicked problem. It's the one I always start with because I came out of doing work on obesity. This is an obesity system map. And I like this map, and I always say this, that uh, I like it because you can't actually read it. Uh, and you can't see what the little boxes are about. And, you, and it conveys one important message to you, which is there's a heck of a lot of interdependencies, and those are important. But there's lots of wicked problems in this world. This is one about Afghanistan. Uh, this is a piece of work I did um, a few years ago around the complexity of knowledge mobilization and the systems that are relevant for knowledge, knowledge mobilization. Excuse me, knowledge mobilization. Uh, but the most important thing is just to think uh, spaghetti and meatballs, right? So just think, you know, nodes and connections. And, you know, you pull one of those strands of spaghetti, and it may or may not have anything to do with moving one of those meatballs uh, on the other side of the plate. So easiest way to kind of keep that in mind. Lots of variables, lots of interdependencies, and health system transformation is really about that. It's quite different from a hierarchy. And hierarchies have these kind of much more siloed and rigid structures and compartmentalized uh, activities. And it's really a struggle when you take a, a siloed system or a hierarchical system like government and you try to solve a complex or wicked problem. It, it creates some interesting challenges. So here's the summary slide of the differences between uh, complicated or simple problems and complex problems or complex systems. And I, I don't have time to go through all of these. You'll be familiar with some of this, but it's very clear when there's a lot of heterogeneity in the system, uh, nonlinearities, um, uh, stochastic or random behavior, things are very dynamic, life course is important, various things like that. These are all things that characterize complex problems as opposed to things that are fairly deterministic, uh, static, uh, where interdependencies don't exist. They're most independent, the relationships between the variables, it really makes a difference. And so we need to start thinking about things like feedback loops and the fact that complex systems can be adaptive and self-organizing, and we can even influence what emerges out of a complex system. And that's really the, the sort of change of paradigm that we have to have if we want to tackle complex problems. The common responses to complex problems are things like retreat, despair, believing the problems beyond hope. Uh, assigning blame, we're really good at that, simple solutions. And that one's a little bit interesting because there may be simple solutions if they're the right ones for complex problems. And occasionally we galvanize our collective efforts and invest significant resources. And I've used this slide for many years, was talking about obesity. I think that's true there. I think it's also true in health system transformation. We are trying uh, to bring our collective efforts to make change, but we have to get our heads wrapped around the fact that the kind of change we undertake might need to be a bit different than what we're used to doing. Now, there are many solutions that are appropriate for complex problems, and because I only have 15, 10 to 15 minutes is what I heard, um, 15 minutes, um, I, I'm not going to be able to go through all of these individually, but the, one of the hardest ones, I'm sure, for especially the researchers in the room, but even the policymakers in the room, is the notion that a reductionist paradigm is not that helpful. It doesn't help to spend a lot of time figuring out how A leads to B, because think about those spaghetti and meatballs. 
Even if one meatball is connected to another meatball by a strand of spaghetti, it may or may not have an impact on the system as a whole if you've sorted that out, that one isolated thing, and you try to change it, it may not because of self-adaptation and, and things like that change. So that's a really hard one to get your head wrapped around. Some of the others make a lot of sense um, uh, that, uh, well, and, and this one might be a little hard too, that individuals in that system, all those meatballs count. Uh, you know, whether there's hundreds of them or not, they all count. It's important. We need to think about the fact that each individual in a complex system has a certain capacity to, to undertake the tasks that they have, and we have to make choices there, and, and we have to make their tasks feasible for them, et cetera, et cetera. Things like networks and teams make sense. Um, uh, building trust makes sense probably intuitively to you in a complex system. But these are all important solutions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a, a, a few examples of how these apply in the work that's happening here in BC around system transformation. The other framework I really like when I think about complex systems comes from Trish Greenhall's very detailed meta-narrative about spread of innovation in service organizations. And there's a range of ways we can go. We can either let it happen, we can make it happen. Make it happen tends to happen in a top-down hierarchical system. Let it happen tends to be what we do in a very distributed, complex, networked system. But what we really need to do is think about how we help it happen. How do we help make the change that we want to make? And she identified a number of different parameters that really support help it happens. Its mechanism is social and technical. We are negotiating and influencing and enable people, enabling people to do the complex decisions making that they need to do. And we need to think about diffusion, negotiation, and knowledge transfer as mechanisms by which we actually spread those innovations in service organizations. So this may be a frame that people will find helpful as well. So back to my key messages. Hopefully I've convinced you that uh, wicked problems are different in their characteristics than simple or complicated problems. And if not, let's have a chat afterwards. We can walk, work on that. Uh, integration is going on here in BC as it is in many other places in Canada, and I would argue it's a wicked problem. I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to explain that, but it is clearly a wicked problem from our experience. And I want to combine that understanding of what's going on here briefly, or a brief introduction to integration here in BC, with the notion that a learning system and learning from what we do is really important. Creating those feedback loops and the knowledge-based information flows and interdependencies can be very helpful. So um, this is the innovation and change agenda. It's probably already been shown at the meeting, but um, uh, here in BC. Uh, and I bring it to you to just position where we're working on this problem. The first is to point out that Triple AAAM is the target for integration, or for the innovation and change agenda here in BC, and that one of the major initiatives in the innovation and change agenda is integration of primary and community care. Uh, I was really interested to hear Brian Hutchinson talk about the fact that you need horizontal integration if you're going to get vertical integration when you think about primary care. I think that's uh, an important piece. So really, in quick summary, integration, integrated primary and community care here, the vision that came out of uh, the work that's being done is that it's an integrated system of community-based health care where services are coordinated and delivered in the community by a family physician and then is integrated into a health care team. And it's starting on the ground level. It's clearly been disseminated. The innovation in this is really happening uh, in communities, and I believe the intent is to have 45 collaborative service uh, committees that bring primary care and community care together. Four target populations, frail elderly, the ones that are obviously important to many of us across Canada, people with con complex chronic conditions, et cetera. So this is really quite high level view of what integration is. I brought the governance framework diagram. I'm not even sure it's totally up to date, but just to illustrate again, uh, I hope you can't actually read it. The important part here is that there's many different relevant structures to integration and trying to make integration work. One of the things I, I, I find interesting when I step back from this picture is the attempt to kind of fit a complex inter set of interrelations since relationships into a bit of a hierarchy, and you can see it's kind of hierarchical in its structure. If you can read it, you see, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of top down in the way the uh, boxes are positioned. But you can also see that there's lots of interdependencies in intercommunication that's clearly part of that, and that makes this a, a messy uh, uh, problem. Now, we at Michael Smith have been supporting uh, the work of IPCC through the development of a monitoring, evaluation, and learning system. MELS stands for Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning, and we 
talk about it as the people, the data, and the processes necessary to really learn from what's going on in integration at multiple levels. So you, there's lots of people involved. I'll show you that a bit later. Um, the data is about linkage of ministry and health authority data, about bringing in new primary data, uh, PREMS and PROMS, for example, so that we can really understand AAA. And the processes, which we often don't pay enough attention to, and really are the places that we need to focus on when we think about complex problems. So this is one visual. Uh, we had a poster presentation yesterday about MELS, and it tries to convey the notion that Pro Plan, Do, Study, Act is really important, that there are three levels in this system. There's the local, regional, and provincial level. When I was looking at it this morning, I was debating which end of the wedge should be the small and which should be the big end of the wedge. And you could, you can, depending on what lens you want to put on it, it's different. But the fact that, we're, that there's local innovation, uh, regional coordination, and uh, regional evaluation Evaluate, coordination of regional evaluation and, and provincial level needs of understanding is, is one of the interesting challenges in this kind of exercise. It's a big system, lots of messy uh, relationships, uh, lots of uh, uh, relationships that have existed for many, many years, so building trust is, is, is an important component. There's lots of evaluation questions associated with this. You see them mapped on to triple aim. Uh, I'm not going to go through them in de detail, but there's lots we need to learn from this kind of a complex uh, exercise. And so some sort of a monitoring, evaluation, and learning system really can be an important component of learning from what we're trying to accomplish here around integration. So I'm going to come to my, my lessons learned um, in my role as president and CEO of an organization supporting ministry, health authority, and community level learning um, uh, using the MELS system. The first is, you know, from where I sit, building trust and strong relationships is key. It's key at all levels. It is key at the top level. It's key between levels. It's really an interesting uh, and, and very important thing. We tend not to measure it. We tend not to give it much credit. And yet without it, we're in deep trouble. It really is essential to being able to do uh, and do challenging things in a system like this. The second is that it takes time for networks to become communities of practice and systems of influence. One part of the MELS project is the deployment of uh, evaluators in each of the regional health authorities. We, we are funding, through Michael Smith, three evaluators, one lead and two community evaluators, some who are here, um, in each of the health authorities to come together and through networking them, our role is to bring them together in a networked function to do things like shared measurement. And in the beginning, there was more sense of of, uh, ownership or uh, relationship to their health authorities than to the community of practice. And so they were a network of disparate networks. But over time and working together, they're becoming a community of practice where they actually see the value of coming together and sharing what they've learned. And over time, we hope that they will ultimately become what I would call, and Margaret Wheatley calls, a system of influence, where they really can influence the learning and the progress that's taken place. Distributing uh, decision, action, and authority is hard when you take uh, kind of a top-down system like uh, health care tends to sort of fit in and you try to apply it to something that's messy and wicked and you want to distribute uh, decision-making, that's challenging. I can, uh, you know, I've got examples of just the simple trying to develop an inventory and the challenges that existed when that inventory of what's going on in integration, um, uh, you know, when one level wanted to uh, have have some more control over the other level. It, it was an interesting challenge, and, and it slowed us down. So we have to keep and pay attention to this. Um, early on, effectiveness is really about the effectiveness of the process, our functional goals. And later on, it'll be about the outcomes and the targets that we set. But it's hard for a system to really achieve, to, to recognize that process targets are just as valuable and more valuable early on than those outcome targets. And outcomes take time, especially when you're dealing with things like frail elderly and chronic complex conditions. And shared measurement needs to be negotiated. We need to help it happen. This takes time. We can do it through um, uh, networking, and we can do it through other mechanisms. But it's one way for us to really understand how, uh, how context matters when you're making progress around integration on the ground in different communities. So uh, these are the kinds of things that we've learned uh, so far. 
So hopefully I've communicated to you that uh, the problem we're talking about in my short time, that the problem we're talking about is a wicked complex problem, that we have different types of solutions for these problems, and that system transformation, regardless of the nature of the problem that you're working on, really needs to ha it be helped by having a learning system. And I'll just close with a, a list of many of the people, probably not all, who've been involved both in uh, our MEL system and in interfacing with our MEL system and uh, the integration of primary and community care. And we thank everybody for, for their hard work in this. And I thank you for your attention.